<coughs> so, good evening, everybody. Many thanks for joining us this evening. Happy 4th of July. Um, some great whiskies for you to try tonight. Um, there is the chat function. At the bottom of your screen, you click on the chat. It'll pull up on the, the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat. Uh, Stuart Quayle, he'll uh, keep an eye on the chat for me and, and throw the questions at me. Uh, my guest this evening uh, had technical issues and can't join in with us uh, in America. Uh, I, I reckon it's just they're going out to watch some fireworks display this afternoon. I'm probably get extremely drunk elsewhere. But uh, we've got some great whiskies for you to go through this evening. Some, some you may be familiar with and some you're very familiar with and some maybe, maybe not so. Um, <laughs> back in January, uh, myself and the staff go through sort of like a, a calendar and look at the, the next few months of what we're going to do for our whiskey tastings. We, we generally try to do them every week in the shop or every fortnight. Um, the one thing we said back in January is that we are not going to do an American whiskey tasting on the 4th of July. What we're going to try and do is we're going to give them a bit more credit and do them two or three times over the course of the year. Uh, obviously things changed a little bit and then we had lots of different ideas and availability of whiskey uh, during lockdown was a bit more difficult. So the, the plans changed and so here we are, 4th of July drinking American whiskey. Hopefully we'll have more American whiskey tastings before the end of the year and we can get access to, to some a few more different brands that wouldn't be re readily available here. Um, there's not a shortage of whiskey, Laura. We're lucky there. We've got plenty for you tonight. Plenty going forward. Um, so I think the first thing we'll do is we'll get the first whiskey in your glass. It's more of a, an, an opener more than anything, uh, just to get you started. Whiskey number one. Um, and it's, I just tried it there myself. I can try it there this, this morning. Yeah, yeah, don't judge me. It was research. Uh, and our first whiskey is a uh, Rebel Yell, small batch um, reserve. This is actually discontinued about a year and a half ago. Uh, well, that's a bit longer, back end of 2018. Um, this is 45.3% ABV. Uh, and this is actually the old branding of Rebel Yell. Um, it's quite a... Give it a try. Even at, like, it's quite, I think, quite strange at 45%. It's, percent. it's a little higher than what we yeah, see. Some of the some Irish whiskies would come in at, um, you know, we normally we start at about 40. In fact, I think all our, all our American whiskies this evening are, uh, are, are 45 or above. But I, I actually, like, if, if, you're, you're, if you're trying American whiskey for the first time, or you, you know, some of you might be familiar with some of them, this is actually quite, quite a lighter style. Uh, of American whiskey, and um, there's a bit of a minefield to go through with with American whiskeys. You know, we've got all the, the big brands that we, we, we might be familiar with. You know, at the top end, you know, your Pappy Van Winkles and whatnot, uh, and then down at the lower end, your your, your Jack Daniels, um, Maker's Mark, uh, etc., etc. Uh, what's the other one? I forgot. Wild Turkey. Um, so. <laughs> for making American whiskey and bourbon in particular, you've got different mash bills. The mash bill for bourbon states you have to have 51% of the mash bill in corn. So a minimum of corn. And then you can add other, other grains, predominantly rye, wheat, malted barley. Um, so if you start messing around these different proportions of what you've got in there, you know, if you've got 51% corn and 20% rye and 20% malted barley, nine percent um, wheat and, and if you start switching over and mixing it around you're, you're going to come up with lots and lots and lots of different flavor profiles and that, that, that's is what i've noticed and we've gone through over the years is when you look at some of the distilleries for instance uh, four roses maybe four or five different type mash bills um as do the buffalo trace distillery we've got three whiskeys from them later on uh They've all got it playing around with everything. So you can create loads of different flavor profiles. If anyone was on the tasting last night with the, the Tipperary, we were all oh, like five, four single malts and a single grain. And we were talking a lot about cask influence and what, what that does to, to, to the, and like where, where flavor and whiskey comes from. We were even talking about different strains of malted barley, possibly different yeast strains. Uh, 
So this is like this is a really good sort of different mash bills and what different you know different grains go into it. So th this mash bill is sixty eight percent corn, uh, twenty percent wheat, and twelve percent rye. So I think the, the softness of this whiskey really comes in with one that's quite a bit of corn and quite a bit of wheat. The 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 twelve percent rye doesn't add a when you most rye whiskies have a spicy element to them. Uh, I don't really get much you know that pepperiness. It's very, very light. Yeah, Laura, this would have been Heaven Hill. Um, they, they, forgive me, there's going to be, I'm going to make a few mistakes now because as we cross over between different distilleries and different brands, it's, it can be a bit of a mindful trying to remember it all. I do have notes here. I've more notes than I've actually ever used in any whiskey tasting before just to, to keep me prompted and keep me on course. But this is what Heaven Hill is doing. Heaven Hill make a lot, a lot of different whiskies. Uh, some of the most popular ones would be Elijah Craig, be quite a popular whiskey from them. Um, I think the company now is called Luxco, and I think they have their own distilling, um, their own distillery now. Um, I think this is. I would be getting excited about this as, as a bourbon, but I think it's a nice introduction to. Who, to bourbon, it, it's almost like if you were com comparing it to Scotland, like would you would you give someone an Arbeck or a, or a Froig as their first step or whiskey? You know, you, you might scare them off whiskey for life for all them big smoky flavours, and it could be the same with a lot of uh, American whiskies. A lot of them can be full, and rich, full bodied and rich, and lots of going on. Um, I think I think to uh, what we've got in most of our American whiskies, like, they're quite young. Uh, the maturation is, is, is in virgin oak, as we would, we would describe it. Barrels are only used once before they're, they're shipped all over the world, down to Scotland and Ireland for, for, for further maturation of, of their whiskies. So a young whiskey, but Poole's got a lot of flavours. It's, um, a lot of butteriness there, which you expect from like a, from a corn grain style whiskey. Jesus, how many people is there? Is this a... Sorry, I'm just getting people still join there. Please bear with me. So, Brian and Tanya, there's no age statement on any of our whiskey tonight, bar one. Um, but this is a don't around about the five to six year old. It'd be quite young, if not younger. We all good. I should have muted everybody on arrival. <laughs> Um, any any thoughts on that? Um, anybody want to jump in and, and tell me what they think of the, the whiskey? Like what what flavour are they getting here? Um, well, I think a little bit of that pepperiness comes at the very end, but it's, it's very 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 subtle. That's it. Um, this has never been uh, sort of readily available in Ireland. It was actually Michael Waller who just joined us there. I actually picked this up on his way back from Spain. He drove from the south of Spain all the way back to Ireland towards the end of lockdown restrictions. Uh, he was stranded out there. Although I can think of worse places to be stranded than lockdown with the weather out there. Yeah, there's a lot more, or there's a lot more wheat in this than what we're going to see in a lot of our other whiskies, and I think that provides softness. And for by comparison, for what's more accessible for us on this side of the the world, a lot of as we were saying last night, a lot of Scotch single grain whiskies would be predominantly wheat based, as opposed to like corn or maize, as we have here. So here Sorry, what's, the first, what's the what's the first one we're supposed to be looking at? Number one, I guess. So your number one, yeah. Um, and it's the uh, Rebel Yell uh, Small Batch Reserve. Um, this was the, the drink of choice of Keith Richards, I believe. Maybe they, maybe they named it after him, you know. Um, 
And it's red, red, yeah, yeah. It's a, a nice whiskey. I think it's a nice sort of entry to what we're, what we're coming up for next. Um, I'll start. I'll we'll move on to the next one because I, I brought this one and I didn't actually mention this in the the, the sort of the, the tasting bio um, because I wanted to throw something at you a little bit different. Um, I'm, maybe some of you can guess the the brand name that's coming up, but uh, I, I just I didn't want to put you off buying tickets for it. But I thought we'd throw in a Jack Daniels into the mix. And this is a Jack Daniels single barrel. And I wanted to I wanted to bring this in for, for, for a reason. We've, we've done it on a, our Space Eye tasting a few uh, months back. We brought in Glenn Fiddick, huge international brand, well known around the world, but not always um, not always well respected within the whiskey community. But I love bringing these brands and exploring these brands because it's like the, the Jack Daniels that we're most familiar with is the old number seven brand and it's just the, the sort of taller square bottle than this. Um, most commonly drunk with Coca-Cola globally. But the, 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 it's amazing when you think the, the sales of this, of Jack Daniels, um, it, you know, it's even found in a can with Coca-Cola and, and places like Australia ready to drink tins of it. Um, the reason I'm putting these brands in, if we were to look at um, back closer to home, all right, and uh, like a whiskey like Jameson, which millions and millions and millions of bottles a year, and when you think about things like Jameson, they provide they provide cash flow right, for the distilleries, and they provide, and, 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 you know, by, by churning out volume, that means that we're lucky enough to get whiskies like Redbreast, Powers, Chons Lane, you know, all these single pot stills. So when you step up a levels in the Jack Daniels, there's, you know, there's different levels of Jack Daniels as well. And this is one of the sort of moving up the ladder a little bit. And uh, I chose the single barrel select um, as it was it was brought out in probably in the late 80s, early 90s um, by a master, their master bestower, I think it was number six, they're on number seven now, uh, a guy called Jimmy Bedford. And I had to put this in because it was his sort of creation and, I, unfortunately, Jimmy's passed away. I think he passed away in two thousand nine. But I had the pleasure of meeting Jimmy several times over the years, mainly in London through whiskey festivals. And um, in two thousand and seven, uh, I was over for a whiskey awards ceremony. I worked in a hotel bar called Brooks Hotel on Drury Street at the time, and we were nominated for whiskey bar of the year. So we travelled over to London myself and one of the hotel managers um, as we, we were hoping to win the award. But we turned up quite early and there was like a drinks reception at the beginning of the awards. And on the lens of the function room, you know, there's about 20 metres worth of tables, uh, you know, these pop-up tables and fold-up tables. And it's almost made like a bar counter. And there was a couple hundred bottles of whiskey on the table. So we're there first and I walk up and the deal was it was all free. You can have what you want. And, and then I, this, is, this is heaven for me, you know. And just all this whiskey in front of them. I, I, I generally can't remember what I actually picked as my, as my first whiskey of the evening because I was so shocked at what I seen next. Uh, it was just the most amazing thing and it, it changed my sort of view of how you drink whiskey. And um, it was Jimmy Bedford from the Master of Story, Jack Daniels had walked into the room. So it was myself and my manager from the hotel, Tom, and uh, Jimmy Bedford in the room, and Jimmy walks up to the counter, and uh, you know, there's all this whiskey there, all this whiskey, and I've, I've actually, I remember spotting this bottle, and I says, I'm gonna have that next, so I'm gonna have that later. And uh, anyway, Jimmy pops up and picks this bottle out. It was about of any 30 year old. Um, you know, if, if anyone, you know, some of the whiskeys we've had over the last few weeks, we've had some really good old whiskeys, a couple of weeks ago with a teal and 28 year old, phenomenal stuff. I think a bottle of any 30 you know, runs between five and 700 pounds in the UK at the moment, uh, roughly. And so Jimmy orders his bottle of uh, 30 year old, and uh, would like a Diet Coke to go with that, please. And uh, mixed it there. So I'm sort of standing there, I don't know, in shock, horror <laughs> at the time. I was still quite young, I was still in my, in my 20s. And then, like, 
I'm mean, almost speechless. I don't know what to say. And the reality is we're the only three people in the room. So you have to have a conversation. <laughs> and you know, I can be a bit of a cheeky bugger at times. And, and, and I was just, as he was coming over, I just got the nudge from Tom, my hotel manager, basically telling me, don't say a word. And uh, I had to say, I had to say, I said, why did you, why did you choose that whiskey? And he says, I don't know what I chose. It's just, I just like, a, it's, it's a warm day outside. I want, I want a whiskey, but I want to have it mixed with Coca-Cola and I really enjoy it. You know, I'm Jimmy Bedford. I'm the master bestower at Jack Daniels. And I, and I had to say, I said, do you know how much that, that, that whiskey is? And he says, says, I don't really care. At the end of the day, it's there. If I could afford to buy it, I'd buy it. If I want to drink, I'll drink the whiskey the way I want to drink it. And I went, you know what? Fair enough. And, and from then on, it's always stuck with me. Um, and I, when I, I've seen customers over the years buy heavy smoky whiskeys and mix them with, you know, soft drinks. Um, we, we make whiskeys with cocktails all the time. And for me, that was, you know, you know what? You're absolutely right. You know, if you're buying a whiskey, it's your choice how you drink it, you know? Uh, I, I can never agree with him drinking a bottle of any 30 year old with a Diet Coca Cola mine, but that was his choice. Um, unfortunately, I think I do remember that. Fortunately, I did get a, I was able to run and grab myself a bottle of any 30 year old before he got any more to mix it with. Um, sure, are you keeping an eye on the chat here? There's quite a lot of stuff coming up I'm, I'm missing. And just Sorry, I'll unroll really the kids there for a minute. I couldn't no talk. There's a lot of noise in here. I think it's just a lot of people talking about tasting notes. Yeah, they are. Uh, they really enjoyed the first one. There's a great starting off whiskey. Um, there's a couple of ones that are going on up. Uh, where are we at? Best in the nose, yeah. Um, hmm. White pepper on the first one. The second one then... They're saying I got into my I have to, 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 to pour it. You I think talking too much? Fair to say, around the around the world, there's always going to be big brands everywhere, and um, for me, having these big brands is extremely important. You know, they they they, they produce the line shares and the distilleries, and by doing that, they give us access to all the other small batch little stuff that comes around. Uh, if you look at one of the, the big giants in Scotland of a whiskey, Johnny Walker, you know, it's it, people turn their nose up to all the time. But without that, yeah, well, Jadji yeah, would probably have billions, wouldn't they? You know, <laughs> they don't need whiskey to make billions. Uh, it certainly helps. But we wouldn't get access to some of that, you know, think of Lagavulin, Kalila, Talisker, Oban, you know, all these, you know, big powerhouse single malt whiskies that we all enjoy, you know. I'm not I'm not the biggest fan of Lagavulin. and people know me for that, but I know most a lot of people probably on here have at least tried it once and, and, and really enjoy it. And without things like these behemoth of giant brands churning out money for the company, we don't we don't get access to these. We didn't have these things. So we should be grateful because if you look at like the you know 85% of whiskey sales are blended whiskies. And only the other fifteen percent are single malts. You know we won't get them without these big brands. So it's it's this is for me is sort of like a reminder of just what we, what we, what we have and why we need some of these brands. This is forty five percent. There's a great question from Chris Green. This is Tennessee whiskey, but which is not a bourbon. Um, can you touch yeah, okay. on the difference? So it is a bourbon. So from a production process, bourbon can actually be made anywhere in America. It's not just specifically to Kentucky. You can make a bourbon anywhere. As long as it's made with 51% corn, uh, as Craig's just pumped up there. As long as you've got that, you know, that there. There is a difference in Tennessee, and it's called the Lincoln County process, and it's a filtration process. Um, it's, it was always talked about. I don't think it was ever law until very recently. It was written in some American law books and whatnot. The Lincoln County process is essentially filtering your whiskey through a charcoal. So you get a load of char, a load of, a load of wood, things of maple wood at Jack Daniels, and it, you, you basically set it on fire. Um, you, you cool it down, and then you grind up this, this, this charcoal, and you put it in big vats. I think uh, 
Jack Daniels is it's about three meters deep. So imagine a big hole that, uh, or nearly like two two stories tall, and you filter the whiskey through that. And that's called the Lincoln County process. Uh, I think every whiskey produced in Tennessee now, bar one, has to uh, has to have that to be called a Tennessee whiskey now. Uh, it's always been regarded in whiskey circles that was there was a way, but I don't think it was ever legally defining. Um, but that's uh, that's essentially the the, the difference with uh, Tennessee whiskey to bourbon, uh, to, sorry, Kentucky or Kentucky whiskey. Bourbon can be made anywhere in America. There's there's no there's no stipulation of that. Um, what's what's good to see in America, I would have loved to have had some of the smaller brands, and I think there's. And we, we say we're losing count of the, um, the amount of whiskies that we have distilleries in Ireland. We're coming up to nearly 30 odd in Ireland at the moment. Uh, America had their craft whiskey distilling boom probably nearly 10 years ago. And there's, I don't know, there's 1,000, 1,500. It's, it's insane the amount of small distilleries over there. Uh, and my, my guest that couldn't make it tonight, um, Pat Ridgely, who comes over to Ireland every year. Um, always brings us countless samples of whiskey and it's great he travels around Ireland visiting all his friends with him and his friend Park with two suitcases full of, of all this small produced American whiskey and it's great he starts with us and he finishes with us and everything that's left over is in the shop uh, it's, it's actually great sure there must be Countless amounts uh, in that back room of uh, American whiskey. Yeah, all stop telling everybody. Small, it's for us. <laughs> <laughs> all these uh, small different producers. Um, but yeah, American American whiskey on the bigger distillers can be quite hard to get your head around. There's a there's a big distillery in Indiana called MGP that I don't know probably nearly a hundred brands of whiskey come out there. A lot of it's predominantly rye whiskey. Um, things like you've maybe heard of brands like Whistle Pig and Bullet Bourbon. Rye, they would all be produced there. In fact, I think it's, it's like it. it's almost like our version of Cooley, you know. Uh, we see all these, you know, we can we see it here. We know we know when whiskies are released in Ireland, we, we know that you know they're from Cooley, and over oh, the next few years, it'll be Great Northern. You know, they're, they're just they're, they'll sell to individuals. If you want a brand of whiskey, you can go there and you'll get it. So, if you don't want it to build a distillery in, 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 in America, you go to MGP and they'll make you a whiskey. Uh, and there's countless stuff. I mean, sure, you had stuff there from the whiskey tribe last year, um, which was actually, it's all very nice, but it's, there's a lot of it. But the, the good thing about, I think, with something like MGP or even like Heaven Hill and, you know, Buffalo Trace, all these distilleries with all these different whiskies, it comes down to the mash bill and you can create these different recipes. Um, and we were able to do that in Ireland for years. And we still can, but it's been restricted a little bit now with a technical file that I think, you know, the whiskey has to be made, made a portion of malted and unmalted barley, if you want to call it pot still, and up to 5% of other grains. So that, you know, that gives a little bit of restriction. Yes, you can play around with different levels of malt, but if you've only got 5% to play around with things like rye, oats, wheat, you, you'll find it very hard to create different flavor profiles. And like, it'll be really interesting, especially the last three, but they're all from three distilleries, one distillery, but actually two different mash bills. So it'll be interesting to see the, the difference there. Um, the mash bill on this Jack Daniels is 80% corn. So a lot higher, a lot higher than our previous one. 12% um, barley and 8% rye. Um, I'm sure most of you have tried I'm a little bit behind. I was talking too much. So Chris is asking, it's not just bourbon because it's American. It's down to the corn and the grain bill. Yeah. So you have to have that minimum 51% there. Once you have that in there, you're, 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 on, you're on your way to be a bourbon. Uh, as, a, as a third whiskey, when we move on to that, it'll switch the other way around. Uh, it's another more generic brand, but I, I thought we could put it in there. But, um, just as, as, and it's actually a rye whiskey. Um, Here's a great question from Laura. Um, high amount of corn leads to sticky uh, sweetness. Is that right? Um, Ambi, either way. Probably goes by the barrel or by the cask. I see there's a lot of different factors in there as well. You know, like if you've got a, 
a, a low rye content, you're going to have a higher sweet content from the corn. Yeah, so yeah, I suppose it is there. You've got a bit of barley in there, different fermentation times, you know. Um, distillation would have an, a, a factor in, in on these whiskies as well. And American distillation is very different. To, we're, we're used to um, pot still distillation, which essentially we, we make our whiskey in kettles, if you think about it that way. We fill the kettle up, we boil it, we take off the vapour and we cool that vapour down. Then we stick it in another kettle and do the same thing. And, and you know, if we do it twice, it's double distillation. If we do it three times, it's triple distillation. Uh, a, a good example of sort of what they would do in America. America essentially, a lot of it has to have, it's called a pot still doubler. You've got your copper pot still at the bottom, and then you've got what's a column still at, on, on top of that. So you can do the all that process. Jack O'Shea, you would be more familiar with that. Uh, and Pierce Lyons, actually, distillery has something similar. Uh, they have that copper pot still, and then on top of it, they've got a column. And in that column, you've got these plates that you can turn the plates and whatever, and control how fast the vapor rises, uh, the contact with the metal in there. So it's another way of controlling flavor as well within within a, in in your in, in batch distillation. It's it's a very different way. Um, one of the one of the people who are unique and a little bit different to um, to that is actually the Pierce Lyons Distillery itself in, in Lexington and the town branch. They they actually have Scottish copper pot stills in their distillery, sort of breaking tradition with what they do in America. Although our next whiskey does the same, similar. And then over there, their Irish distillery has American stills in it, actually from a very well-respected American stillmaker. Is it Vendome? Is it Jack? Yeah, it's Vendome, and uh, those few plates on top of your spirits will give you great uh, separation and uh, give you a lot of copper contact. So they're a, a, a big plus. But you are right. This is a, this is what you have in your your standard um, American stuff. After that, then you have what's called the tumper. Do you want to tell me about the tumper? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> it's just basically a big vessel where your vapor comes down into the vessel, and it condenses. And as it more and more vapor comes, it it uh, evaporates what's at the bottom of the tumper, and that comes up then, and it goes goes out of the um, out of your system. So it gives you another separation. And you can you combine that with <clears throat> different mash bills. You're, you're you're getting different flavor profiles. You're getting lighter spirits, heavier spirits. So there's so much there's so much going on. It's it's an, an, another way to look at it. It's, it's like some of the Irish distillers do as well. And you you blend in whiskey like Liam's there saying there's there's a high amount of corn, amazing and Irish blends as well. And that's true. Probably like ninety two to ninety five percent in in a Jameson sort of thing. And uh, some of the entry level blends would be as, as that high. But you, you know, if you're making these different whiskies and you can create different blends, that's another way of doing it. Um, you can create so many different flavors, so many different whiskies. It's, it's almost endless, you know. Um, we'll have to get a mathematician and tell us how to work it out. I think. But, um, I but again, it's the, it's the heat over there as well, I would say, by the, the casks. The, well, my my observation can be a bit different over there as well. I've actually got a picture. I was going to leave it till later on. It's just a maturation warehouse in it, in 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 Kentucky. But you know, when we were, were talking about Angel Share in in, in in whiskey in Ireland and Scotland, if you, we fill our barrels at sixty three percent ABV in in Ireland in the UK, and that that alcohol volume will come down over time. Um, if, you, if you were there last night, you would have. You would have seen a, a 2002 cask that was like 55 percent, and a 2002 cask that was 48 percent. It was widely different, and you know they're in the same warehouse for so long. Uh, that happens. Um, so in, in in America, you know you you go and, you go into a barrel, a similar thing, but the alcohol vapor rises. It's actually the water within the compound and the water compound in there that evaporates. So the water compounds grow more. The yeah, ABV is going up, and you're limited to what you can bring that ABV up. I think it's about, I think it's about 80, it's in the seventies or eighties, and you'll see some, I think, uh, like some of the, the the Buffalo Trace Antique Collection will be really, really up there. Higher, higher. I think it's mostly in the eighties, Michael, as I know anyway. It has to be in the eighties for a bourbon. 
Yeah. Um, what does okay. anyone think of the Jack Daniels? Um, yeah or nay? You know, what is it? Just a so we've got uh, one from Chris Green saying that Jack Daniels 80% corn, 12% barley, yeah, that's, that's 80% dry. Yeah, hey, um, Jack Daniels, uh, Jameson would be the same. Jameson, 80% corn. No, Jameson would be about probably in the nine, probably 90. Okay. Um, a traditional, like, if you go and, go and visit a, the, the technical lab of, of, of Irish distilleries, so something like Great Northern Cooley or Middleton, you know, the bigger plants, and if you wanted to, if you were there and you were going, right, I want to buy uh, a blend of whiskey. I want to put a, 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 a whiskey out to market and I want it to be under 30 euros, say the Jameson price range. They'll probably come back at you with like 92% and somewhere between 92% and 95% corn whiskey and 5% other. Um, and I, I know that from experience of uh, visiting these places and especially Great Northern, that's what they'd be offering you. Uh, and they'll be trying to recreate similar flavor profiles. Uh, Liam, no, this is not the standard uh, JD. We're, we're up a level. Uh, it's a single barrel. Uh, it is the same mash bill of, uh, of the regular JD. Um, certainly a little bit older. Uh, I think this is seven, eight to nine, seven to nine. Hold on. Seven to, I think it's about seven years as well. Uh, although, you know, age in American whiskey, it's not as important, I suppose, because you're using virgin oak, so you're getting lots of wood contact very early from a from a brand new barrel that's heavy in vanillins and just all these compounds. So there's a lot going on there, really. Um, lots of flavour getting into the whiskey from very early, and that's why if you take that barrel from America, bring it over here and put our whiskey in it, it takes a bit longer because there's quite a lot of that flavour gone from it. Uh, I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's it's just a process, essentially. Um, our next whiskey, um, I wanted to bring in a rye. It's just to mix it up, so we had a rye mash bill. Um, I'm not convinced that this is the greatest. It's a great brand. I'm not con convinced it's the the greatest rye in the world for for spicy tones. Um, sorry, it's in the last. So I decided to bring in it's something that's quite more easy and accessible in Ireland, and that's why I want to put it there as well. I didn't want to blow your heads off uh, chili pepper spice that you can find in some higher higher content. So we've gone for a Woodford Reserve rye here. Um, when we're familiar, forty five point two percent. I mentioned uh, NGP, a, a, a big massive distillery in Indiana, in America. A lot of rye whiskey is produced there. Um, making rye whiskey isn't very easy. It's um, um, if you've ever make rye, rye whiskey when you 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 break down the grains uh, to to start like doing fer fermentation, it's almost like a porridge. It's this big gloopy. You can almost the more the more rye grain you've got in there, the almost more wallpapery paste like it gets. Extremely hard to for fermentation. A lot of a lot of distilleries don't like doing it. Obviously, the plant in Indiana is well set up for it, very capable. Capable. But this is actually made by in Woodford Reserve. Woodford Reserve, um, as we talked about, that that pot still doubler and, and thumper that Jack was on about in distilleries in America. They actually distilled in copper pot stills in the same sort of style that we would be more familiar with in Ireland and Scotland. Um, and I had a great debate now, probably, yeah, 2008, it wasn't long after the, the, the Jimmy Bedford and the, the Balvenie, I met Chris Morris, the master distiller uh, for Woodford Reserve, actually in the, the Four Seasons Hotel down in Balls Bridge of all places. Uh, we had a lunch. Uh, I, I don't know how I managed to blag my way onto it, but it was all press and journalists and me. And uh, sorry. And someone else, the, the bar manager from Shanahan's on the green, uh, because they used a load of Woodford Reserve in that bar uh, in their cocktail. So uh, I managed to blag my way onto it. I, I, I don't know how, I can't remember. The, the gray matter is not working. 
One of the most interesting things, sorry, this is sample number three. We're still on number three. I'm a, I'm a little bit uh, uh, behind it. The Mulligan Gazette, you know. Mulligans, we didn't even have Mulligans at the time, you know. I think, uh, where was I then? So I'd actually, yeah, I'd probably just left Brooks Hotel from being the bar manager there and I was working in Celtic Whiskey Shop. Uh, so I was probably at the time, Ali was being really nice to me as a new employee and said, here you go, off to lunch with these lads and drink some whiskey and have a nice big steak in the Four Seasons because you'll never eat there again. <laughs> Not in the wages he paid anyway. <laughs> um, but <laughs> so it's... So Stuart's getting the, the, the mash bill up before me. This is this is brilliant because I have it written down, but he's got it up there. You're, you're very fast on the old Google, you know. It's taken me a week to get these numbers, making phone calls. So, yeah, this is 53% rye. So as opposed to, like, remember saying, you know, if it, one, one, once there's less corn in whiskey, the dominant grain becomes that sort of, that's the whiskey. So this is why we have rye, you know, then the rye would have to be 51% as well, minimum. And you would say with wheat. Um, let's try this and see. I find this remarkably light um, for the style of whiskey. Um, it's very different from the previous two. Uh, and in the lineup, it probably... I was expecting a bit more, a, a more of an oomph because we, we normally have a break out. We have a break after whiskey number three, and I wanted that to be sort of the gap. Where um, but coming after the Jack, the Jack Daniels there, it's probably it's probably a bit light for that. But anyway, I had it when we sat at Chris Morris there. We're back in the four seasons. An interesting debate at the time before the Irish technical file was uh, published as it is today with all these like a little bit stricter control on what we can do in making whiskey here is um technically uh, if they, they actually make a style of whiskey that back then in 2008 could have been called a single pot still whiskey because there would be there's you know the, the, the regular whiskey not the rye here that we have would contain malted barley, unmalted barley, grain, and different grains. So there was no sort of legal definition back in 2008. It's only very recently that we started putting these balls in. Obviously, they couldn't call it Irish, but it'd be the closest thing that you can get to. I think back then it was called pure pot still. Um, it'd be the closest thing because there's not many, not many whiskies. And back then, there wouldn't be many whiskies made in copper pot stills. I think... Jack, only, only, only back in, what was it? It would have been only 2008, 2009 that um, Pierce was opening up his distillery in America then, wasn't it? Yeah, it, it was uh, back around then, all right. He, uh, he, was a, he was the first malt producer in the States since yeah. uh, 1919. So uh, he, has, he has that distinction. And his... Uh, he, he started making whiskey in Kentucky with uh, Foresight stills. And as you mentioned, then he, he brought Vindum stills to Ireland. So it is kind of arse about phase. So more depth and a bigger flavour compared to the first two. It's coming a bit, it's coming through for me more. I still feel lighter. It's lighter than what I expected, but then Jack's furnished me with uh, a good few rice samples over the years. I think. Jack, did you give me one from the UK? From England at one stage, it was nearly 100% rye. It was, it was, and it was like, it wasn't like drinking whiskey. It was literally like eating peppercorns because it was so spicy. It was, it was sort yeah. of mind boggling and mind blowing stuff. We told them not to make mm. any more, I think. Mm. <laughs> uh, anytime I come across any, anything I want tasted, I always turn up on your doorstep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, someone's going to have to pay for my liver transplant. So what would I recommend for a high spicy rye? Um, actually, as we mentioned, that MGP distillery in Indiana, um, they, they make quite a lot mm -hmm. so, uh, of whiskies there, and a lot of rye whiskey there, and they're very good at it. Uh, the Bullet Rye, uh, from a more accessible point of view, which is available for you, uh, Templeton Rye, 
uh, there's a couple of expressions there, a four-year-old and a six-year-old, and uh, whistle pig. Whistle pig uh, is, a, is a really nice, I would I'd, I'd say there's excellent quality control in what they do. Um, Michael Waller's in Kilvega made a ride a few years ago, it was lovely. And there was, it was, it was, it was made by uh, it was made by Alex Chasco, <laughs> the American distiller who's now at Teeling. Um, but um, yeah, and that was, but that rye came out in two thousand and eighteen. I think it's still uh, available. The Kilbegan rye was, I think, it was about eight years old. But technically, they were looking at to make that as a single pot still. But when the technical file came out and changed, it could no longer be called a single pot still. But it was a, it was a rye, and it's it's the first I think one of the first or few of the first whiskies in Ireland to be labelled rye, which is good. So that's a nice. For me, what you're looking for in rye is you want that little bit spicy bite there, you know. Something. Yeah, we should call it. And then Missy Marsh does not really recall. Turn your sound off, Brian. Missy, yeah, what is the one? Thankfully, I know most of these people. <laughs> Um, it's, I think it's nice. It's, it's nice. I would like to see a little more from this, um, but uh, I mean, may, the distillation technique there might maybe make a difference, you know. But if you're if you're looking for for rye, yeah, some of them brands that I've mentioned, that's something. It's a little bit different. It's um, nowadays there's so many whiskies produced in America. It's very hard to keep up with or or or, or get your hands on them. So we're, we're lucky enough that. Pat comes over here once a year with a suitcase full of the stuff, so we get to try loads. Um, and Stuart is, uh, has become a drop-off point for the whiskey tribe, so you never know what's going to land in the cabinets there. And he's it's, handing out samples during the day. And it's even I don't know what's going on <laughs> half the time. He doesn't tell me. And I'm the last <laughs> to get the samples, you know? Um, it's really no, they, the whiskey tribe did a lot of GMP there, or them, um, GPM, or cheese. Yeah. Um, in GP, um, they do a massive butt, but they got a lot of cast samples from them. Really liked it, and then they made their own through that, mm -hmm. um, through different samples. But they dropped it off to us in the shop, and we're the only ones in Ireland to have it. Um, so anybody from the tribe here came in and got a sample of it, but it went in within, what was it, Michael, like a two, three weeks? It was crazy for a while. Yeah, yeah. Was... But great whiskies. It took me two or three weeks to find out what was going on. <laughs> I was off, I think. <laughs> and then I wanted to use them for something, and I couldn't find them were hidden and all. And Jim Beam Rye, yeah. So there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of big, big rye out there that you can find. And you know, for me, I want that spiciness. It's a very different drink. Uh, you know, for me, I want a rye that's got that spiciness because you want to make a nice Sazerac cocktail out of it. You know, and something really, you know. If you're going to start washing your glass out with absinthe, you know, you want to make sure these flavours are working together really well, you know. Um, so, so far, any anything standing out for you? Anything that, that's really nice? I, I, I was pleasantly surprised that Jack Daniels. I, I haven't had it. Um, I'd like, to, I'd love to get that. Unfortunately, Jim, Jimmy's passed away, uh, actually, two years after I met him. Probably after the horror I told him of drinking Balvenie Thirty over Coca Cola, but I'd, I'd love to, you know, get the old diet coke out of this one just to. And if he was watching down on him, was turning in his grave, sort of thing, you know. No, stop around, that's all too much. Really, also saying that it's spice Perry's getting, which I kind of agree with as well. Um, Marta says smells like strawberries. Don't get strawberries, but everybody's different. I get, I, there's fruit, there's lots of different fruits going on there. Like on the nose, it has that robustness and spiciness. I think it, it you know, when you when you nose a whiskey, uh, for me, what what you smell in a whiskey is what you're going to taste. And I, I feel, and you know, I'm getting a great nose and I'm getting that great spiciness there. Is this number uh, four? Is it? No, we're, we're we're still on number three. We'll, we'll have a short break and we'll get on to number four. We're just, oh, we're just uh, thanks. You're 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 way ahead of yourself. You're having some great party on your own there, pal. <laughs> um, Red berries on the nose, I agree with that. 
Well, yeah, there you are. So your red berries, it's, it's your, you know, your strawberries as well. Strawberries, yeah. Red, red. Like for me, and strawberries, when you eat strawberries, like it's, it's a little bit sweet and a little bit um, creaminess. There is a bit of hint of creaminess there, you know. You said something great last night. Um, somebody's pear is somebody's peach, which is very true. No, somebody's so peaches are someone else's apricot. Oh, sorry, apricot. Sorry. I was just everybody's flavour is, is different. Everyone has different flavour profiles. You know, I I don't know if anyone knows. I actually grow fruit and vegetables. I have a nice little plot of land up in Clonsilla beside the station there, and I grow fruit and vegetables. And this week we'll be harvesting our raspberries. I have two varieties of raspberries there. I've got one that's very soft and creamy, and I've got one that's really big and tart. You know that you know that that cloy and tartness. Um, so you've got a you know. <laughs> You've got different flavors within flavors as well, so you know it's 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 what it's all what you remember. You know, if you were a child and your parents gave you an apple and you were eating that apple and they told you it was an orange, you'd associate that fruit as an orange. You know, it's you'd be programmed that way. You know, it's like programming a computer. Once you tell it what it is, that's what it does. If you tell it the wrong way, it'll do the, you know, it'll do it. You'll think it's that way. Um, anyway, I'm gonna. We're going to have a five-minute break, just to give you a time, uh, comfort break or whatnot, and then we'll move on to our uh, next three whiskies. Next three whiskies are uh, for me are just simply stunning. Um, my my favourite uh, distillery in in America. Um, I'll give you a sneak peek of the bottle first of the, the first of the three. Anyway, there's a, wee, there's a wee eagle on the front of that, so that might give away what we're getting there. And um, this is a it's a cracker. So I'm just going to pause the recording and we'll see you all in five minutes. Jack, I wasn't too pushed to go. I was going to go for the first one, the, uh, the Rebel Yell. Rebel yeah. Yell. Yeah. Yeah. Easy drink. Very easy drink. Lovely yeah. one. And, uh, but I was, uh, what I really liked was the peppery end of this. You know, that uh, that the, um, the Roy gives you. It's a nice pepper flavour in it. Yeah. I got a light herbal kind of mintiness of it as well, which I get that off a lot of rice. Yeah. A lot of people say I'm, I'm wrong, but everybody's different, you know yourself. If, if, just going back to the chat here, um, Liam mentioned uh, this bar in Manchester has its own um, single cask uh, Jack Daniels. Um, actually, if you, if you want a single cask Jack, Jack Daniels, you can actually buy one. Uh, I think you go on the website, it starts about $10,000. <laughs> You can get your own, uh, your, own, your own single barrel Jack Daniels, similar to what we've had. Uh, I think if you fly out there, you can select your own and whatnot. Um, but interestingly, we were, we, were, we were talking during the week about you know the single casks in, in Ireland, and they're, they're, they're coming up quite a lot. If we, if we were to bottle all the privately owned single casks in Ireland at the moment, there'd be a, a bottle of whiskey for every person over the age of 18 on the island of Ireland at the moment. It's, it's it's quite a lot of whiskey. So yeah. if you're going to invest in single cask in Ireland, do do so on the on the the premises that you're probably going to have to gift a lot of it or drink a lot of it. There's no harm in that in, in either, you know. Yeah, I, th I think another thing is, um, I think the industry is guilty of of, of not showing people up front the total cost of a cask. You know, they say a cask for six grand. But there's another six or seven grand on top of that when you add in VAT, duty, marketing, labelling, the whole lot, you know. So yeah. if, if you wanted to buy a cask as an investment, you'd want to end up with a whiskey that you could sell at about 80 euros a bottle. Yeah. Which is the best way, I think, if you buy a cask and when it's, it's mature, get all your friends and head into the warehouse and have a party and drink the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. revenue can't get you because it's only due for revenue if it comes out of the warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> now there's, there's, a, there's an interesting thought now. Uh, <laughs> Craig, Craig actually mentioned there, that's, you know, that, that figure I quoted is, is pre-import, pre-duty. So, you know, yeah. if you get a, a single cask and you say you yield the 300 bottles, you've got to ship that from America all the mm -hmm. way over here. You know, it's, it's, and then you've got to pay your, your duties and all that on top of it. Yeah. And the, 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 the numbers start adding up, I suppose. Yeah. You know? Well, one, one thing you mentioned about Coke and, and whiskey, and there's a guy called Alan Rutherford. I don't know if you've come across him. Uh, he was a production director for whiskey for Diageo for years and years. Like he really 
big guys in the Scottish whiskey industry and he had a, a bank of, of tasters and uh, blenders in the whole shebang. And one of his best blenders always put coke in his whiskey. <laughs> yeah, now this guy is he's blend wonderful whiskies for Diageo, but always put in put in coke. <laughs> so we'll move on to whiskey number four. Uh, I don't think we'll be putting any Coca Cola on that. Uh, this is Eagle Rare uh, from the the Buffalo Trace Distillery uh, in Frankfurt in Kentucky. Um, it's a bit hard to, to show you on the bottle. It's not the, the greatest for for labels for here. Um, I'll read the label out to you. Eagle Rare, Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey, and then a picture of an eagle at the bottom. This is a 10-year-old. It states on the back label. It used to state it on the front label. They've moved it away from there, and it's on the back label. Uh, I've no idea that. This used to be a... This is single barrel as well. Um, they've taken the single barrel statement off of this, and this used to all be hand-bottled. So when you had a single barrel hand-bottled it, they can call it a single barrel. And then it went to onto an automated bottling line, and they, they reckoned that they somewhere in the crossovers they couldn't guarantee that it might be single barrel. So that um, that we did. Does that what the straight 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 bourbon? You you haven't got me. I, I should you have got me because I can't remember. <laughs> uh, straight bourbon is has to be a minimum of that that fifty one percent corn. To be called straight whiskey. It's, it has to be uh, over four years old. It's four years old because you, you can get two year old whiskey there, and there's 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 a little bit of a grey area with three year old whiskey because there's a there's actually a Jack Daniel's green label, isn't there? Sure. Oh, that's right. Yeah. You, you were right. hunting down for years to, to add into your collection, um, and there's that. So there's there's the, the, that's there. Um, and this is ten years old, so it can compare to all this. The mash bill on this, um. So let just move my papers around here. Is this is what we call the Buffalo Trace? Essentially, make four major mash bills. Uh, one is low and rye mash bill number one, low and rye. Uh, mash bill number two, uh, high and rye. Uh, mash bill number three uh, is wheat, and a mash bill number four. I've completely forgotten it. I had it written down. Where have I got? I have it written down somewhere. No, I don't. I forgot to write it down. But we don't have mash bill number three or four tonight. We have mash bill one, two, and then we go back to one. Uh, so this is a low rye escape. But, you know, I, there's at least a minimum. It's very hard to find out the breakdown of what goes into it. It's, they don't like to let you know. Um, one thing from the Buffalo Trace story, a lot of people might be famous with a, a whiskey writer called Jim Murray loves the stuff. Uh, laments every year in all these Bibles, they're always winning awards. And uh, there's a, the, the antique collection. So you, you may have heard of Pappy Van Winkle, William Weller, uh, Weller, William Weller um, Eagle Rare, Sazerac, they all appear in the, the older sort of styles of their whiskey. So there's an Eagle Rare 17. Um, that's it. That's not, I was going to say, it used to be readily available. It's, it's not readily available. It's very hard to come by. Um, you just have to Google them and you know, check the prices out. They're, they're eye-watering what some of the prices go for. Um, I, this is this is purely a personal choice why this is in here tonight. It's one of my favourite whiskies from the Buffalo Trace Distillery. Uh, over here it's a little bit more expensive than the, the, the standard Buffalo Trace. That's around about the 40 euro mark. I think this probably runs at about 60, 70 over here. Um, but this is like, I have a, a habit of trying to get people into trying different whiskies. Um, and my business partner, Colin, he's actually doing a beer tasting somewhere tonight online. Um, I got him into Scotch whiskey and it was Crag and Moore. I mean, we've talked about this before. Every, every birthday, every Christmas, I get Colin a bottle of Crag and Moore um, because that was what I got him into Scotch whiskey and, and he, he loves it, you know. Um, but, a few years ago, we um, we supply Bowes Whiskey Bar on Fleet Street there. Uh, we supply the, 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 the set, and he was looking to expand his range of American whiskies, moving outside the Jim Deems and the Jack Daniels. And uh, we said, okay, we've got some Eagle Rare here for you. Put this behind the bar. A little bit more expensive for a really high-quality bourbon. And uh, myself and Colin had finished work in uh, the pub. It was a Tuesday evening, and we got a... Oh, put that cuckoo cook off, cuckoo clock off, 
<laughs> and then we, um, we decided to go to Bose have a couple of beers and uh, open the, the and christen the bottle behind the bar. So on, on that night, the, the two of us managed to uh, drink half the bottle on the Tuesday. And on Wednesday, we went back into work. We were talking. This was amazing. We really enjoyed this bourbon. This is me, and this is me getting called into trying different American whiskies. Uh, he, he liked it that much that we decided on the Wednesday evening to go back to Bose and that uh, we finished the bottle. So we're, we're, we're our worst customers. Right? We sell whiskey to pubs and then we go and buy it ourselves. It's absolutely terrible. It's, it's no, I, I can assure you, it's no sensible business model. You know? um, this is one of my, my favorites. Um, and Liam saying Buffalo Trace also used to make a really good whiskey called Ancient Age, which is a 10 year old. They make an age and age, Ancient Age, just not ancient. Uh, Buffalo Trace is still used to be called Ancient Age. Uh, it was renamed uh, several years ago. Um, it was renamed after Buffalo Trace. It's, it's situated on an area where the buffalo would have roamed um, back in the day. I'm not sure if uh, they, they, they do that so much these days. Uh, they're, not, they're clearly not running through a distillery. And um, we got a, a picture. I'm going to do a screen share. Uh, give me a second, and uh, I'll show you some of the maturation houses in. Um, one second there. That's a, a maturation warehouse in uh, in Buffalo Trace. So you know, what I like here, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine floors in there for maturation. And you, you can you can scroll around. And uh, we've another one over there. And just you know the, you can see in the, there's one in the, the, the foreground there and background there. And uh, there's another one there. What's, what's interesting is um, we've talked about and we were talking about last night, angel share and all, all these things. If you ever go to a whiskey distillery and um, you're, you're looking at the walls, and this is a great way of looking at the wall. You can see that wall on the left-hand side is black. You know, look at this around here. It's all black. It's almost like a fungus. It's a mold that grows on maturation warehouses. You can't really see it on the trees, they're not clear enough. But even the trees around it there would be covered in black mold as well. And you'll see that quite in, in Scotland a lot. And that's part of that's part of a process um, of and that's you know, if, if people are going to start building warehouses near your house, um, you want to tell them no because <laughs> you know, if you've got beautiful, nice whitewashed walls, then they'll end up black, you know. Um, just to this fungus, it's not harmful. It's not. Uh, it's not going to kill you, but uh, it just doesn't look pleasant. Um, what does anyone think of this? Any 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 comments on this? I think this is so easy to drink. It reminds me of uh, number one, but a bit more souped up, a lot more flavour going on. A lot more. Totally agree. Think this. You know, it's really. Kieran was saying that uh, Frank gave him a bottle. He loved it then. And he still loves it now. Um, best of the bunch so far. Sweet, soft. Very impressed. Um, Laura, lot sharper than Rebel Yell. Yeah, yeah, Rebel Yell was a very light style whiskey. It was a very, you know, it was, it was more, it was extremely approachable. You know, it was very soft. You know, and we're, we're, we're coming up a flavour level here. We really are. And, you know, this is 10 years old. So 10 years old and and, and, and it's what we would know as virgin oak. There's a lot more flavour coming out of that barrel, you know. So much more flavour coming out of that barrel. It's, it's, it's really good. You know, there's a lot more... It's almost a, a touch of tannin in there, you know that, you know that that tea bagginess, you know if you you know if you stew a tea bag too long, there's a touch of that there as well. Um, I'm actually I'm, I'm delighted that we, I have um, quite a large quantity of this bottle left because it's um, I think it'll be my drink of choice uh, next week anyway. I don't know. Um, 
I'll be I'll be dipping into that. Um, it's, it's it's really really nice whiskey. I found uh, very easy drinking this one. Extremely really biased on this. I have to be honest. I'm extremely biased. Uh, uh, if anyone if anyone disagrees with me, feel free to say. Um, but in, for me, this is this is a as like a, a really good sort of bump into 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 bourbon. You know, not a lot of rye in there. It's not a lot of spice, but lots of there's there's hints of tropical fruit coming through here a little bit. You know. There's a good one. Uh, Brian, you get butterscotch on the palate, which I actually just picked up. Yeah, good, you good mean, note. yeah. If you're if you're if you're using like uh, American oak, you're gonna you're gonna get lots of creamy toffee, caramel, butterscotch. You're gonna get these notes. Uh, whether whether it's originals, you know, you you, you will always always come out that because all them vanillins in there are coming out. You know, and you're taking lots of them, and they're they're a lot more stronger than what we would see when we get the barrel. You know. And there's Laura says marzipan. Yep, I get that as well. These are great notes coming through. Mm. Beautiful whiskey. It really is. I mean, I, I'm sorry, but I am biased. Um, I'll move on to whiskey number five. Um, I apologize to anybody who has actually asked us if we sell this whiskey via email over the last few years. There's a good chance that we didn't reply to your email. And we, we get emails about this whiskey all the time. So we have a, I have a filter on it now so that we we sort of park these emails because we really should just reply to them all with a standard email say no, uh, you know, a one word email, no. Um, but that would just be terrible. So we try to get to them when we can and I'll be honest, we, we generally forget about them. So I'm sorry if you've actually asked us about this whiskey. Um, it's something we, we, we don't really get our hands on that often. Uh, when we do, the world goes berserk. Um, it's almost like this month I should have to, have to put a filter on the word Waterford in our, our inboxes on whiskey because every day there's a there's a there's currently someone asking me, uh, "Have you got Waterford whiskey?" Uh, no. <laughs> but uh, this is. Uh, let's, let's show you. It's a horse on it, you know. So this is Blanton's. It's uh, ridiculously hard to come by, even in America. And it's just, you know, people collect it. I think, sure, you'll know more about the collecting side of this than me. People Very much so. It's on the top, don't they? The horse. Yeah, yeah, there is a different stage of the horse running. And there is not a day, Mary, Michael, everybody can tell you, there's not a day goes by that somebody doesn't come into the shop and ask for this. No. So this is a single barrel as well, uh, and uh, this is it's ninety three proof. So that's what forty six point five percent. Forty six point five. Yes. Um, a bit of information. This was stored in warehouse number H on Rick number forty three. So the warehouse number H, pretty simple. You've got A, B, C, D, E, and F and G before that, and then Rick number forty three is probably it's like we would call them rows and columns. And, you know, we've seen that Buffalo Trace warehouse there where there was like, there's nine stories to it, you know, and lots of different things going on in there. There's probably actually more than nine. That's, we've just seen the ventilation windows there. <laughs> uh, good old Rick 43. Was Rick 43 today, was he? Happy birthday, Rick. Um, but this is, so this is um, a different mash bill. It's the same distillery. It's from the Buffalo Trace distillery as well. But it's mash bill number two, which is the one that's high in rye. So it should be a little bit more spicier than the Eagle Rare. Um, wow, the stopper's heavier in the bottle. It's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, you kill somebody with that. <laughs> so I think we... Uh, I've never really sort of alluded to colour on these whiskies, but they're all quite rich and dark, almost mahogany in all the whiskies tonight. Uh, and that, that's a lot of that is from them, them, them fresh bourbon cast, the first bill, the brand new virgin oak that they, they use in America. Like, is it true that they can use colour in America? Yeah, that's part of that. So when you've just jogged my memory there, sure, thanks. Someone was asking about what straight whiskey means, so you can't. 
add any caramel colourant or any flavourings as well. There's a stipulation. Uh, of Michael, straight. sorry, Michael, uh, if you have looked there, that's the stopper from a bar, bar, um, bottle of Blanton's that I used yeah. in an Irish whiskey society tasting about 10 years ago. You can see it's slightly different to your one. The shape of the legs. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. So the legs, see, legs are different there. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, ah, oh, Jesus, Liam, they're the same. I was just looking at the tail. The legs, <laughs> no, <laughs> the not, legs are different. Yeah. There's a massive collection for this. There's a lot of people looking for this all over the world. So Craig's in. There's seven different okay. stoppers. There. I, I the, the, for the right price. <laughs> <laughs> the right price tonight. <laughs> we sell it on eBay. You know. <laughs> Send it down to Anthony, Irish Risky Auction, and you'll get your 20 quid for one of them. Um, uh, so let's, go, let's give this a taste, if you haven't already. Um, I haven't tried this in years, uh, and I mean seven or eight years, because it's just so impossible to get. Whiskey at a Buffalo Trace is, is really hard to get. But as I was saying earlier on, Buffalo Trace distillery make four mash bills. Number one, number two. Number one, low rye. Number two, we're drinking now, high rye. Number three is wheat. Number four, I've completely forgot what it is. I'll have to, I'll have to, Stuart, you'll have to Google that for me. Yep. Um, but they make four mash bills, okay? So think of your William Wellers, your Pappy Van Winkles, your Sazeracs, your Eagle Rare 17. They're all... Um, they're all coming from these same mash bills. So well, people are spending absolutely ridiculous monies on Pappy Van Winkles. You know, if you get the, the same mash bill whiskey, you're getting a, you know, a similar, similar whiskey, maybe a, not as, as old as like there's Pappy's, what there's 12, 15, what, 20, I don't know, 21 or 23, you know, but if you, you, you can still, you know, still find really good quality whiskey from these distilleries without paying the price tags, you know, you just got to be, you got to think outside the box a little bit, you know. See, this for me is what I would call quintessential bourbon. I, my, my, my first sip of this takes all the boxes that what I want to see in a bourbon. Uh, as much as I love Eagle Rare, I generally think this is a better whiskey. Um, it just stands up head and shoulders there. It has that richness. There's a bit of fruitiness there. It's got that big toffiness. There's, there's leather there. There's a little bit of tobacco notes in there. You know, a little tannin. It, it really does. It's got this really nice, lots of things going on. There lots of nice flavours there. And I, I, that's this is what I, this is bourbon to me. This is boom, you know. It really does. It really stands out. Um, this is Blanton's, named after an old army colonel, probably from the American Civil War, called Colonel Blanton. Uh, there's a lot of what are them. We'll, we'll get another colonel in a minute on our on whiskey number six. And um, this is great. And um, I have to say thank you to. Uh, Barbara Whelan uh, on the screen, but it's actually his real name is Michael Waller. Uh, Michael, uh, on his way back from uh, from his lockdown in Spain, uh, like I said, this is very hard to come by in Ireland. I think the last time we had it, we had four bottles. It wasn't even a full case. It was four bottles. A full case would be six in, in the box. We've got four. And uh, Barbara Whelan there, and well, actually Michael and Barbara, were driving back from, um, from the south of Spain. And uh, he's in Cherbourg, I believe. Was it Cherbourg? In the port in Cherbourg. And he goes, right, I'm in one of these wine warehouses. What do you want? I says, well, as much cheap beer as you can get me. He says, no, 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 there's whiskey here. There's whiskey here. And he goes, oh, there's this, and there's this, and there's, there's this, and there's this, and there's this. And he's like, oh, and here's a, they've got Blantons. I am, what? They've got Blantons? And uh, and I wasn't really thinking, so I said, yeah, get me a couple of bottles of Blanton's. We'll do a tasting with that. That's great. We'll get the tasting going with that. That'd be great to have because there's always people asking us for these whiskeys. Uh, more so to collect them because they, they collect the, the, the stopper. I said, it'd be great to do a tasting event so we get people to try this whiskey and enjoy this whiskey. So uh, off he popped his away, away he went and he got some Blanton's for us and that, that was 
that was it. He also got us the rebel yell there as well, and the eagle. And that was that. So, you know, because, you know, if Blanton's appears in Ireland, you're never going to see it open, you know, like this, because it's it's sneaked away and, and, and collected and, and looked at. Instead. Michael, are you going to use your famous tasting note on this one? <laughs> <laughs> I see that. Well, Michael does already put that up there. Yeah. That especially ridden the horse saddle. There is leathery notes there, leather and yeah. tobacco there. And there is, I, I always feel that's almost that luxuriousness. And, you know, in, 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 in Scotland and Ireland, we get that, that them flavours predominantly from sherry casking, the Oloroso and Pedro Jimenez. Uh, there's no Oloroso or Pedro Jimenez in here at all. There's no sherry in there. And so you're getting that richness from the wood, you know, and it really is good. Uh, Michael saying this, every stopper has a, a letter from the name. Uh, my light has gone down here. Um, probably can't see it too well. But... Oh yeah, this has got letter A on it here. I can see there's an A. Uh, it's so tiny. It's just at my thumb there. You, you, I don't know if I can get yeah. it right there. Yeah, mine has an L. L? Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. <laughs> we'll get we'll get the whole set to get. Oh. I'd imagine, imagine, I'd imagine a full set of Blanton's uh, stoppers are probably worth more than the whiskey. They actually are. They are. I don't think, I think there's only a couple um, up in auction sites and they go for a couple of hundred. You actually get the whole cradle as well. So if you contact Blanton's and say you've got the stoppers, they will actually send you out a cradle to put them all in. Okay. In order. Yeah. So we just lie to them and say, um, I've got all the, all the stoppers. Will you send out a cradle? So we get the cradle and we'll sell that auction. <laughs> Anthony, we're up. <laughs> so I, I, that to me, that's uh, really is a standout whiskey for me tonight. That's really has. I, I, it makes me think more about bourbon. It really does. Um, I do. I do love American whiskey, but you know, my accent might tell you what I would default to a lot of the time. Uh, and then the country I live in, Ireland, uh, is also another. A factor that I default to, so I've got a I've got a load of other whiskies that I want to try and drink before American whiskies. Um, so that was Colonel Blanton with the horse on the top. Um, we probably should have mentioned more about horses and when with Woodford because Woodford uh, sponsored the Kentucky Derby, and uh, the Woodford Reserve Bourbon is, is is used in a cocktail, the mint julep. Lots of lots of ice, a bit of sugar, mints, all churned up in a um, sort of like a copper cup. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful cocktail, really refreshing. And uh, I think they serve hundreds of thousands of them at the Kentucky Derby every year. You know, they won't be serving any this year, will they? But uh, probably not next year. The way the COVID's going in America. <laughs> uh, but we'll move on to whiskey number six, and um, this is uh, Colonel E. H. Taylor. And uh, probably uh, an extremely expensive uh, whiskey. It's very hard to come by in Ireland, but we, we get a couple of bottles of this. It's it, it's unfortunately very expensive for us to purchase, which uh, means it's actually a, a really high retail price for us to sell it to you at. Um, I, I, and I'm totally honest about this. You can find this cheaper pretty much in, in anywhere else in Europe. I'm, I'm not going to lie about that. Um, our supplier, I don't know, maybe he has their pricing wrong and just charging too much for it or thinks it's, probably thinks it's one of the antique collection and thinks they can get away with it. Mm. So we, we don't buy a lot of this. Um, um, but, but alcohol is, is 100 proof. So this is our most highest, it's 50% ABV. So this is almost like ABV. Alcohol wise is our, our, our highest. Um, but it's, um, mm. this is, so we on uh, the, the Eagle Rare, which is mash bill number one, the low rye. Then we had Blanton, which is mash bill number two, high rye. We're going back to mash bill number one. So, and this is low rye, but still has its 51% corn. Um, when, when I say, I say low rye, we're probably going to be less than 8% rye. We're going to high rye, probably ending up to 15 to 20%. Um, so this is interesting to compare this to the Eagle Rare. You probably already drank it all, and it's not really to do a comparison drinking, drinking wise. Uh, we're interested to see what you think. Two different, the same mash bill, two different brands. 
you know. So this will be this will be really interesting. I need to I need to clean the glass up. I mean, if we were to look at the colours of the whiskey, there's not much in them really, and they're both dark and rich, you know. Um, Price-wise, you'd imagine it'd be a little bit more older than Eagle Rare. I don't think they allude to anything on the bottle. What percentage is this, Michael, sorry? This is 50% ABV. So yeah, for me, this is, it almost feels like it's a combination of the Eagle Red and Blanton's. Despite this being sort of the, the low, the low rye, it, maybe it's a little bit more prickly, a bit more spicy, and um, probably that little bit exit alcohol in there just makes it a little bit more. There is a collection of these, isn't there? There's this there's, is not the only one. There's actually on the e, under the E H Taylor brand. I, th I do believe there's eleven whiskies, um, and then under Buffalo Trace, the Ancient Age. The Eagle Rare, the 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 Weller, uh, the Pappy, uh, and the Sazerac. And so the Buffalo Trace Distillery is pumping out, you know, well over fifty different styles of whiskey, um, each to their own, you know. And I love to get more into them, you know. They're, they're they're it's very hard to talk to someone within the, the company. They're it it almost feels like it's very very secretive. No, you can't. We can't tell you this. We can't tell you that. You know, um, and why? Why would? Why would they tell you the secrets when they're making absolute millions out of it? You know, um, like the antique collection is just bananas. You know, um, Barbara Whelan there, and Michael Waller, who works in the shop for us, is, is a cracker. Um, I, I don't think there's many American people on here tonight. If they are, we're not going to insult you. Uh, my, well, I haven't, but my Barbara Wheel might. Uh, we always, we always like every day, like we're talking about, we always get asked about Blanton's all the time. Uh, in the height of the summer, which, not this year, but uh, there's not a day goes by when we get, you know, American tourists come in who we, God, we love them because, you know, they spend their money to pay the wages. They're fantastic. There's not a day goes by when one of them walks in and asks, have you got Pappy Van Winkle? Have you got the 23-year-old? And uh, Barbara Whelan on your screen there, Michael Lawler in his lovely pink t-shirt, go, funny you should mention that. We just sold the last bottle five minutes ago. And uh, the two of us go, and, uh, how much did you sell it for? Oh, we sold it for 70 euro. What? 70 euro? Are you having a laugh? Do you know how much that's worth? And he stands there and keeps a straight face. He goes, oh, we couldn't get rid of it. So we put it on discount and got rid of it for 70 euro. And he, he, does, he does this daily in the whiskey shop. And as me as an employer, I should not be encouraging that sort of behavior. But it's... But it we have to keep a straight funny. face. He <laughs> just does this. And we don't know about it. And then we have to keep a straight face. Going, yes, sir. It's, it's terrible behavior, but it's... You know, yeah, I mean, for me, I, I like the fact that my employees enjoy their job and have some fun at their job. What's the point otherwise? You know, you've got to have fun and enjoy them, enjoy your enjoy your work. And um, you know, I, I think any of you who've been to the shop will, will understand what the staff are like. They're fantastic. They're absolutely amazing people. They'll help. One, with everything. one guy, one guy, one guy came in and I told him that, and he had a meltdown in front of me. <laughs> And his wife was there, and he had given up cigarettes. And he said, "I need a cigarette." <laughs> and his wife was, "You, you're okay, sweetheart." He had a complete meltdown. I felt so bad then. <laughs> I think I, I, one day I, I'd been away down to the post office or something, and I walked back in, and you, I, it could be the same gentleman, and you, you, you just uh, told the story, and I think it was an ex-member of staff now that was there, maybe Koch or Kieran. 
And I just looked over to them and I said, has he just done the story on the, the, the Papi Van Winkle? And I just got, yep, and nodded ahead. And I just got the office and started rolling around laugh, laughing. <laughs> you, you, you were terrible. You, it's, you, you do a great, you, uh, for, all, for as long as I've known you, you've done it. And it, it, it is fun. It, it is great. Maybe not to the, the person on the other end of it, but um, they don't know any wiser. But like we, we do, it's like the th- the thing about things like you know that that antique collection from Buffalo Trace, which you know involves high end eagle rare, you know, the the Wellers, the Papes, you know the Sazeracs. Getting your hands on them, it comes down to two things. Right? The people who are going to get these, the, 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 the retailers that are going to get these are the retailers who sell lots and lots of Buffalo Trace, the entry-level bourbon. You know, if you're selling millions of cases of that a year, of course, you're going to get the lion's share of all the premium stuff. If you're at El Mulligan Whiskey Shop where you might sell a bottle of Buffalo Trace bourbon every couple of weeks, you're not going to get many opportunities to get these bottles. Uh, and Celtic Whiskey Shop, uh, who would sell a little bit more than us and a little bit bigger than us, they, they, they get an allocation and they do like a, a lottery draw. And as part of the lottery draw, you have to buy a bottle of the regular Buffalo Trace, I think, to get entered into the draw, which is only fair as well, because the majority of people who end up with these bottles at, at, at the face value price make a lot of money. Uh, I'd say that probably, probably north of 95% of these bottles are, are flipped on auction sites. Uh, and not really drank, you know. Um, so and that's why I like the fact that we've opened our Blantons here tonight and drank it, you know. Um, even each Taylor, which is getting a bit harder to come by as well, opening these and drinking them, you know. It's great, it's great crack, isn't it? That, that, for me, whiskey's for drinking, you know. And everybody on here who's a whiskey collector I have sold bottles of whiskey to is now going, you bugger you. Um, <laughs> You can make one money out of whiskey collecting it and buying and selling it. If you do, well done. Um, I'll, I'll I'll stick to the, the the drinking part of it. <laughs> you're Michael. I'm sorry to say, but you're the one who got me into the whiskey. It's your fault <laughs> that I collect whiskey, and I work for you, and there's whiskey all around me. So my wages go straight to you again. Does anybody want to know what Stuart used to drink ten years ago? Can we mute this? Can we stop this? Oh, uh, you can't mute me. <laughs> Stuart was a Captain Morgan's and Coke drinker <sighs> ten years ago, and that's it, Stuart. It's actually ten years ago this week because we opened the pub. we opened the pub on the first of July, and when we opened the pub, Stuart was in on the first of July, the second of July, the third of July, the fourth of July, and the fifth of July, and so we just gave him a job eventually. <laughs> You haven't got rid of five, five or six days. Like, oh, can you start next week? Then go on. Just, just come in. You know, you know, you're, you're here if you'd be anybody. You know, we might as well get something out of you. Uh, so we we paid him, and then he'd sit there at the bar at the end of that and drink his wages. So it was win win for us. You know? And he's still here now, ten years later. You know. <laughs> uh, yes, Brian and Tanya, it has been recorded. So just just if anyone didn't hear that, Stuart used to drink Captain Morgan's and Coke. You know, he'll go in. The, he'll go in the Hall of Fame with Jimmy Fed Bedford and his Balvenie and Coca Cola. There you are. You know. <laughs> At least he didn't spend. It, he didn't use a five hundred quid bottle to drink. You know. <laughs> you know, muting yourself doesn't mute me. So everyone can hear what I'm saying. You know. <laughs> I know. I know. I don't know what to say from that. I'm like, yeah. We all have our mistakes. You have to remember, I'm I'm a 42 year old Scotsman, um, I started I started on the old tenants lager, at eight, well 18 legally at 18. I'm 42 now, 24 years later, and I still drink tenants lager. You know, I do I do I'm lucky I drink lots of great whiskies and whatnot. But as Liam says, we all have to start somewhere. You know, I haven't grown up on the on the the, the, the beer side of things. I have on the whiskey side of things. Um, so. Everybody, thanks very much for uh, choosing to spend your July the 4th with us. And I know there's been lots of other uh, American whiskey tastings on today. It seems the day that everybody does it. Uh, I do plan to do one before the end of the year. With, uh, uh, definitely online. All our tastings will be online and live online for the foreseeable future, definitely for 2020 and 2021. Hopefully we'll be able to start welcoming people into the shop for tastings as well with the old social distancing and all of that. Um, but we'll, we'll be keeping it going online for a long time. I mean, we'll have more American whiskies. 
um, what Pat Pat Ridgely, the my guest that couldn't make it for technical issues. The technical issue being that he wanted to drink a bottle of whiskey on his own tonight. Um, he'll be bringing us some more lovely whiskies over from America, stuff that we will never get our hands on over here. And we'll do an we'll do an event with him. It'll be really good. Um, and loads more events coming up. Um, nothing. All we've all we've got for now between now and the, the 24th of July or the 31st of July is I've got our online whiskey festival distilled. You, know, you can buy tickets at distilled.irish. Uh, that's on a Saturday between 3 p.m. and 8 p.m. Uh, it's all recorded. It's all going to be watched back. You don't have to drink all 15 whiskies that are in your pack on the same night. You know, you know, treat it with a bit of respect. They've got great whiskies. Sit down, and enjoy them. You know, there's master classes that last 30, 40 minutes. You can, you know, if you've got a spare half hour on the Monday when you put the kids to bed, sit down, and enjoy these two whiskies. You don't have to drink it all on the day. It's a, it's a great event. Um, 70 quid for 15, 14 whiskies and a cocktail uh, delivered. You know, it's it's great. And Just uh, put the link up there as well. So anybody who wants to go into it. Part of that is that hopefully we'll be announcing on Monday. Um, I have this uh, bottle that some of you may be familiar with. <gasps> a, a Red Breast Dream Cast. Everyone who's purchased the ticket already or purchased a ticket next week will be entered into a draw to do a master class with this free of charge. So we're going to have 25 people who are going to win a sample of this and get a free masterclass with this and a couple of other red wrists in the family. So we, we, we couldn't figure out how we were going to divide this bottle up to get as many people to taste it as possible. So this is what we're doing. Anyone who buys a ticket for our whiskey festival will enter into a draw. And that, so the, the chances of winning are about, I'll be honest, about 30 to 1. And we've got 25 samples. That's at the upper end. Uh, if we don't sell any more, that many more tickets, it'll be down to about 25 to 1. You know, so if we're in that sort of parameters. And it'll be a great afternoon. I know the pubs are opening up and everything's going on and they're starting to open up again. But, um, you know, not everybody can make it to Dublin to a whiskey festival. So this is an opportunity online to do stuff. And then we'll be back towards the end of July with our Friday night tastings and some Saturday night tastings like this. Uh, we've got a plan. I've got um, 12 whiskey tasting's already planned for August, September and right into October. And they've got some absolute stunners lined up. Absolute amazing stuff. Uh, I think we've done a we've done a great job over the last three, four months with the whiskey tastings. So that sort of that, that, that put a benchmark down. So we we're, we're gonna we're gonna go a little bit more and then um, go a bit higher and go again. Yeah, Liam was saying twist your gallons arm and to get a couple more. In fairness, Liam, he did actually give us a bottle last year for our tasting. So we'll try. You never know. That would bring the odds right down, you know. <laughs> we get another bottle of that. So but, uh, thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the whiskies this evening. Uh, feel free. I'm just going to stop the recording for everybody. But uh, feel free to keep chatting amongst yourselves on, on, on here. Um, there's no panic to run away. Tell us what your thoughts are. And if you've got any ideas for any up and coming tastings of whiskies that you'd like to see us present to you. And, and please feel free to put whiskies in that could be hard to get. We've got contacts around the globe that we can try and source stuff, you know, so um, who knows, we'll, we'll, we'll try and get, get our, do our best to, to do some a nice tasting event for you. So thank you very much.